So we're going to get started on proving something we've been using for a really long time. Well, since Calc 1. So before we get started, it's a little bit strange, but you can rewrite x to the n as e to the n ln x. How does that work? We're basically just changing some letters. Before we had a to the x equals e to the x ln a. So we're just changing around some of the letters. So our base is not a, but our base is x now. So you can see the base is going to go up there. And then n is the exponent, which goes where the exponent should go. So we can rewrite x to the n as e to the n ln x. And what is the derivative of x to the n? x to the n divided by n minus 1. So we get n x to the n minus 1, power rule. When we proved the power rule in calc 1, we assumed n was an integer. And we used some funky factoring. So we proved it when n was an integer. I never showed you that it was true for n is anything except an integer. And I think we only we assumed it was a positive integer as well. So we're going to prove this for all n. So I'll prove this for all n. So let's start our proof. We're going to begin by rewriting it with the e to the n times ln x. How do I go about taking this derivative? What rule do I really need? I need to know e to the x derivative. What else do I need? So, so it's e to the n ln x. That's the way the e to the x derivative is e to the x. So I just copy it over. What else do I have? Times the integral of the n ln x. So chain rule times derivative of n ln x. All right, so we get constant multiple rule. Bring the n out front of the derivative times n times d d x ln x. All right, test your short-term memory. What's the derivative of natural log x? One, one over x. One over x. So this is one over x. I'm going to rewrite e to the n ln x as x to the n. So I'm going to rewrite this e to the n ln x as x to the n power. So I just rewrote that first term using that identity that we talked about at the beginning of class. All right, we're going to simplify this down now. I have x to the n times x to the negative first power. So add those together. You get n x to the n minus 1. So I did not assume anything about the power of, or about the value of n. Didn't have to be anything in particular. It's kind of boring if n is 0. What's the derivative of x to the 0 power? Almost. It's the derivative of 1 which is 0. So it even works when x is 0. So we just proved the power rule that you've been using for a while, but now you can be sure that it's true. Now we're going to take the derivative of a to the x. How in the world can we start this derivative? 
what in the world is a to the x? Let's see what we have written down for a to the x. Somewhere we defined it. Uh -oh, did we not define it? I thought we did. There we go. Dev I just didn't put it in a box. So there's the definition. We'll go with the e to the x ln a. So we we'll use that as the definition of a to the x. So go ahead and compute this derivative now. It shouldn't be any harder than the one that I computed earlier. So it should be almost the same. In fact, you don't even really need chain you, The chain rule is very easy on this one. It's just constant multiple. Just remember, ln of a is a number, not a function. <coughs> So e to the x ln a is just a to the x. And what about the derivative? What's the derivative of x times ln a? You're thinking too hard. x times a number, what's the derivative? That number, ln a. So I think the way it's usually written is, let's see. Oh, it is usually written in this order. All right. So the derivative a to the x is a to the x times ln a. Would we need to use the chain rule for the inner one also? Um, you could. What's the derivative of, well, just remember, this is x times some constant. So the derivative of x times a constant is the constant. So you just decrease the power of x by 1. So that's all, all we did, except the constant is a little bit more, looks a little more complicated. There's our derivative. We do get a free antiderivative. We'll write that down now. So antiderivative a to the u du. All we're going to do is move the, a, uh, the ln a to the other side. So we get 1 over ln a times a to the u plus c. You could leave the lna on the left side, but we try to clear out the, anti <coughs> the integral side of extra constants. So we just moved it over. So what did I tell you about the number e? So it was a number such that the natural log was 1. And we said it had to be some number we estimated between 2 and 3. You could get approximations for it. I think 2.71 is um, a pretty good two decimal place approximation. We're going to look at e in a slightly different way now. e is also a limit. Limit as x approaches 0. of 1 plus x to the 1 over x power. So 
So let's, before we go and prove this limit, let's look at what's actually happening. So we have the limit of when x gets very small, we're basically taking the limit of 1 raised to what power? The infinity power. So it's going to be something strange. <coughs> and we're going to find this limit very carefully. Why in the world this be e? We'll find out. So we begin with f of x is ln x. Then f prime is 1 over x. And f prime of 1 is 1 over 1, which is 1. And now we're going to look at the definition of derivative. So it's limit h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So f of x plus h is ln x plus h minus ln x divided by h. So there's no reason to think that this is going to end up proving what we're trying to show. But hopefully it will. What natural log algebraic property can I use here? Subtracting to natural logs. So subtraction outside is division inside. Addition outside is multiplication inside. And subtraction outside is addition inside. Whoa. Subtraction outside is the yeah, division inside. ln x plus h over x. Now, let's go with, uh, let's multiply by 1 over h so we don't have what looks like fractions of fractions. So let's split this into x over x, which is 1 plus h over x. So I just split up the fraction right there to x over x plus h over x. So 1 plus h over x. What can I do with coefficients in front of natural logs? So what can this 1 over h turn into inside? So, um, so coefficients outside turn into exponents inside. So this is what to the 1 over h power. That's how I can write this. Oh, it's a really bad h. 1 over h. So I just use algebraic properties of natural log to get to here. So good news is I know the answer to this question. What's the derivative? 1 over x. So we have this identity. Let's let, what would be a bad x value? There's a few bad x values here to use, but what would be a very obvious bad x value to use? Zero. Zero would be obviously bad. If you think about the function, what is the domain of natural log? Almost. So it's definitely not 0, but 0 to positive infinity. So as long as our x is between 0 and infinity, we're OK. So I'm going to choose x equals 1. No problem. That's between 0 and infinity, not divided by 0. So we got 1 over 1 equals lim h approaches 0, ln 1 plus h over 1 to 1 over h power.
right, so this limit is 1. Natural log, ln x is continuous. So one of the most useful properties of limits and continuous functions is you can push the limit through a continuous function. So I said that in Calc 1, and we're going to use it right now. Limits can be pushed through <coughs> continuous functions. So what in the world do I mean by this? When f is continuous at x equals a, lim x approaches a, f of x. We know this equals f of a. That's what it means to be continuous. You can just plug in that a value. So this was way back, Calc 1, Chapter 2. So probably the first three weeks of Calc class. Another way to write this is f of limit x approaches a of x. So that's another way to write a, is the limit of x is x approaches a. So all I'm going to do is cut out the middle term right here, and just the first and the last ones are equal. So this is what I mean by pushing a limit through a continuous function. So if you know your function is continuous, you can push a limit through your function. So I'm going to do that with using the fact that natural log is continuous. So I'm going to push this limit through the natural log function. So that's what I'm going to do here. Let me change the color. So we're going to push the limit through the natural log function. And I should be a little more careful that 1 over h power is inside the natural log. So it was a little ambiguous without the extra parentheses around there. So that 1 plus h, the input for natural log is not 1 plus h, it's 1 plus h to the 1 over h power. So I just put the extra parentheses to be clear. And so the only thing that we're basically passing limit through is a natural log function. So here we have limit, h pushes 0. How do I get natural log out of here? I can't divide by natural log, but I can sort of do that. How do I get natural log? How do I get this out of here? So we're going to take the inverse. So we got 1 equals some function of some expression. I'm going to take the inverse function on both sides. So we're going to use natural log inverse. Inverse of 1 equals ln inverse of ln of all this stuff. And what is natural log inverse of natural log? They cancel out right here. So we have ln inverse is e, e to the first power equals lim h approaches 0, and e to the first power is just e. And that's what we were trying to show. When you finish a proof, you get to draw a little box and color it in. So there we go. The only difference is H, just swap the letter H out for X. And you got what we started with. I, I do not expect you to do any of the proofs on midterms or quizzes, so all the proofs I show you are just for your own enjoyment, or they're really for my enjoyment and for your uh, learning benefit. And they also let us go back and look at properties that we may have forgotten, like pushing limits through functions, through continuous functions. So we'll do some computations of derivatives now. Find ddx of 3 to the x, and 
and then 3 to the sine x. So find these two derivatives right now. What you need should be up in a box, uh, maybe a half page back or so in your notes. So there's a derivative you need at the top of the screen, right there. So any derivative questions? The second one, the chain rule, is the only thing that you have to pay a little extra attention to. All right, we're going to do an integral now. Antiderivative cos x times 2 to the sine x dx. So what antiderivative formula do we have? We have this one, a to the u du. So let's rewrite that a to the u du. That's 1 over ln a times a to the u plus c. All right. Easy question, what is a? 2. 2. So we've got a good base. Problem is we got that stupid sine and cosine right here. So how do we get rid of? or change those around. U substitution. Exactly right. So we write u's, the antiderivatives, we write them with u's in general. So your mind is already thinking about u substitution. You could write them with any letter. You could write them with x or any other. Don't write it with a d. That would look horrible and you'll have two d's in a row. Uh, so let's do u sub. What's a good choice for u? Sine x. So compute du, and go ahead and find the antiderivative with the u substitution. So there's our antiderivative. Right, any questions on the u sub or the unsub? So we looked at natural logs and then went to any base, or natural exp exponent with a natural base and then went to any base. And so now we're going to go to logarithms with uh, any base in your log. So we did natural logs first, and we're going to do uh, any base now. So our good bases are between 0 and 1 and 1 to infinity. So A can be anywhere in those two intervals. And we call this a good base.
So that's what it means to be a good base. And we'll define this log base A of X. This will be the inverse of a to the x. So if we write it out more carefully, actually we'll stick to this for now. Well, algebraically it looks like this. You can flip your logarithm around. So this means a to the y equals x. So if you flip around with the inverse, you're basically moving the log base a to the other side as the inverse, which is a to the x. So that's how it moves to the other side. And I think we did pre-cal 1. We did exponentials first and then defined logarithms to be their inverse. So we sort of went the other direction. We started with exponentials and then said the log is the inverse. <clears throat> so let's look at some properties. Let me label this with properties before we start writing properties. So this last property, you're going to mainly use this for web work answers because web work only takes log base e or log base 10. So if you have a log base 3 or 2 or any other number that's not 10 or e, you'll have to use that last one right here. <coughs> so the last one, you pretty much only need it on web work. So how do these first two properties work? These are basically what it means to be an inverse function. So if we look at how this is defined, right here, your a raised to this power. What is this power? It's the inverse of a to the x function. So it cancels out to x. And then this log base a of a to the x, that's this function log base a of its inverse right there. So it cancels out. So these are the first two properties are just by definition. And we have to be a little careful, our x right here, the input for log base a has to be greater than 0. The reason on the second one I don't have to be careful, does raising a to any power, is that a problem as long as your base is positive? That's just fine. And so even if x is negative or 0, you don't actually get 0 here, you'll get uh, a to the x is never equal to 0 for any x value. So that's why you can do all x's. And we better take a derivative now and see why that works. Oh, we should prove that last one. Why does that work? So we're going to prove this. We'll let y equal log base a of x. Flip this around to the inverse, a to the y equals x. And now we're going to take ln of both sides. And what can I do with this ln a to the y? 
I could bring that exponent out as a coefficient. So inside of a log, coefficients become exponents become coefficients outside. And if we solve for y, we have ln x over ln a, and then unsubstitute for our y, so our y was log a of x. So we have our identity, our property that we wanted to prove right there. So we defined log base a of x. Let's go ahead and take some, we looked at some algebraic properties. We'll look at some derivatives, derivative properties by taking a derivative. So it's 1 over ln a times 1 over x. That's the derivative of log base a. It's almost like derivative of natural log, except you do get the 1 over x, but there's a constant in front. So to prove this, what we're going to do is take ddx of the identity written right above. And I don't know the derivative of the left side, so I'm just going to leave it as derivative of the left side. But I can write down derivative of the right side. Let's rewrite it as a product. So it's actually a constant multiple rule right here. So that 1 over ln a, I could bring that outside derivative. And what is the derivative of just regular ln x? That's just 1 over x right there. So there's our derivative is 1 over ln a times 1 over x. So we got two more problems. We'll do one derivative and one antiderivative. So compute derivative log base 10, 3x plus 1. So you just need a little chain rule here. So there's our chain rule, 1 over natural log 10 times 1 over 3x plus 1 times 3. So our last example from this section, antiderivative log base 2 of x divided by x. So one thing you'll notice, there's no antiderivative with the log. I told you the derivative of log base ax, there's no antiderivative that I wrote down of log base a of x. We will find the antiderivative, we just don't have the tools to do it yet. Just like we don't have the tools to do the antiderivative of natural log. So that was, maybe you didn't notice that, but that was one of the few derivatives I didn't give you a free antiderivative with. So we will get the antiderivative, we just have to work a little harder, develop some more uh, concepts, what we need is the 
oh, integration by parts, which is basically the anti-chain rule. So there's no nice formula for this natural log, or for this log base two. So I don't know the derivative of this off the top of my head. What can you do? There's basically two things you can do. You can try calculus tricks, which you only know one, and that's the U sub. The other option is algebra. I don't see any algebra that's going to work. If we, were, uh, if we had a log base 2 of x plus log base 2 of something else, I could write that as a product. Uh, but I don't know log base 2 divided by x. There's no nice rule for that. So let's go with the U sub. So bad choice is x. So I don't choose x. 1 over x, it's actually sort of reasonable. But 1 over x derivative it doesn't turn into log. So that's not going to get us to where we want to go. So what's another reasonable choice? Log 2 of x. So find du carefully, and then go ahead and make your u sub. And hopefully, things will work out nicely. write down your u and your du. It's, you have to do a u sub on this one. So I have the U sub on the board now. You should be able to carefully, basically the way I solved it, what I just circled is ln2 du. So any questions about what's written in the black marker? So just unsubstitute, and it's relatively straightforward. I wrote in the red marker here because this in it is an ambiguous way to write uh, log base 2 of x squared. When I read this, it looks like it's parenthesized like that. So you want to be careful if you're squaring your log of uh, x, you want to make sure the whole thing is in parentheses squared, or else it looks like what's in the red here. So you want to be very careful. And unfortunately, there's no nice identities for log times log. Log plus log, log minus log, or number times log, totally fine. But log squared or log to a power, there's no identity for that. So forget that whole thing there. So that's the end of 7.3, and next up is 7.4. So I'm going to try to talk about the next section before I flip the page so you have time to write stuff down. We're still going to talk about 7.4. So next section is exponential change and separable differential equations. Very scary word for something that's not terribly scary. You've basically been solving these already. You just didn't know it. So we're going to start out with an easy differential equation that's separable, and then solve it, and then talk about what does separable differential equation actually mean. So 
So we'll start off with an example. <coughs> so K is going to be constant in this equation. So this is a differential equation because there's derivative in it. Any equation that has derivative in it, or second derivative, or third derivative, or any number of derivatives, is called a differential equation. It's an equation because it's uh, two expressions with an equal sign in between. That's what it takes to make an equation. So the way we're going to solve this, we're going to collect all the t's on one side, all the y's on the other, and then think about how do we get rid of the dy dt. So I want all the y's. Ooh. Y's on the left, and our T's on the right, and it, K is constant, so it doesn't matter what side K lands on, so I'll just leave K on the right side. So I'm going to do something a little strange. I'm going to treat this DT like it's a fraction. So I'm going to multiply by DT, Ooh. DT. And then the last thing I have to do, get the y out of here. So I'm going to multiply by 1 over y to get the y out. So we separated everything. y's on the left, t's on the right. And if you have any constants, it doesn't matter what side they end up on. How do I get rid of dy? What calculus operation do I do that uh, after I'm done, there won't be a dy left? Almost. Antiderivative. So we're going to apply an integral. And remember, when you're doing math, as long as you treat both sides fairly, you're pretty much doing the right thing. Well, and that you do, you treat both sides fairly and actually uh, perform those operations correctly. So integrate both sides. Right side, what is the antiderivative of a constant with respect to t? Let's do guess and check. What's the t derivative of k times t? k. So that's the antiderivative, because the derivative is the line before. Uh, right side, that's a Slightly new antiderivative. What is antiderivative 1 over y? Can't use the anti power rule. It's the only power you can't. Ln y. Ln y. We did not have endpoints on our uh, antiderivatives, so we need a plus c. Now, here would be a bad thing to do. If I go plus c plus c, They'll cancel each other out. So really, you get a different constant for each integral you did. And let's so try to solve for y. So let's get c1 to the other side. So if you take two constants and subtract them, you get a brand new constant. So two constants subtracted makes a new constant. So we'll let c equal c2 minus c1, some new constant. So what this means is anytime you integrate both sides of an equation, you can just do a plus c on one of the two sides. You don't have to do a plus c on each side. Technically, you get two constants, but you can just look at the difference of the two constants, and that's your new constant. All right, how do I solve for y itself? How do I get rid of natural log? Inverse of natural log. Inverse natural log on both sides. So we're going to apply, and I don't really have the room to write ln inverse. I'll try to squeeze it in right there. It'll snap back as soon as I let my finger go. So we're doing ln inverse of that whole equation right there. Oh, it didn't snap back. ln inverse of ln y equals ln kt plus c. Oh, 
Well, an inverse of kt plus c. Okay. So left side cancels. That's why we did it. Right side is e kt plus c, which I can rewrite e to the kt times e to the c. And let's look at e to the c another time. e to a constant is just another constant. We'll call it C3. Actually, they use the letter capital A for some reason. And we like to put our coefficients first. A, E to the KT, we'll write it like that. So how do you check if you integrate it correctly? Derivative. Take derivative. So we can check this very easily. This particular differential equation, we're looking at the beginning part right here. Just find out what is dy dt. It better be gay y. This doesn't quite look like KY. In fact, there's no Y's in here whatsoever. So what I have to do is basically unsubstitute back out for Y. So what is Y? Y is A E to the KT. So I'm going to collect the A E to the KT together. So what I have in parentheses is Y right there. So that is the solution to our original differential equation. So this is all, well, it's not really all new stuff. We use all the same techniques we did before. We're just looking at things a slightly different way. And we'll be out of differential equations very quickly. All of the separable differential equation, equations will line up one variable on one side, one on the other side, take an antiderivative. That's how all these problems will work from this section. So you're not really doing anything new other than some algebra before you do your antiderivative.